So um, this paper is about mostly demographic, a little bit of popularity biases in uh, the field of recommender systems. It is joint work with my colleague Soleil Para and our students at the People and Information Research Team. This great group of people. So the core question that I want to raise, the, the, the brief takeaway, is that we need to think about who gets what benefit from our systems. Is the bene if we have a system that's supposed to be benefiting its users, is it benefiting all of them? How is that benefit distributed? And when we go and we measure that, are we okay with the results? That's our primary normative claim in this paper. The rest is descriptive of going and diving in and how do we see that play out in recommender systems. So I want to provide a little bit of background first to explain what a recommender system is. I'm sure almost all of you, probably all of you, have interacted with them, but you may not be familiar with them as an object of study. So they show up all over the internet, and they're recommending news articles for us to click on, movies for us to watch. Um, your app store has a recommender that's showing you what apps you might want to buy. You, it's difficult to go to a modern website that is collecting any kind of data and not encounter one of these things somewhere. They're also fairly impactful. Tanea talked uh, earlier today about the impact that the movies we watch have on our view of the world, and some of that impact is mediated through the recommender showing us what movies we might want to watch. So we kind of have this compounding effect. And the, the best available public data is that Netflix, about 85% of movie watching activity on Netflix is driven by the recommender. About 30% of sales on Amazon are driven by the recommender. So these things are having substantial and profound impact on the experiences of the users of the system and of the users of the internet. And so this is part of our broader set of questions around how do we make sure that the information systems that we're building are good for all of the people that they affect? That's kind of the motivating question behind a lot of my research these days, is trying to understand how we can make sure systems are good for the people they affect. And that depends on our definition of good, and it depends on what, how we're consider what set of people and what groups of people we're considering in trying to understand this. So for this work, we're looking at do different demographic groups obtain different utility from the system? And we're assuming recommender systems in a context where they're intended to provide value for their users, uh, such as recommending new music that they might want to f listen to, helping them find movies, et cetera. And we want to know, is the recommender doing as good a job for the different people that it's supposed to be serving? And fairness and recommendation is a tricky and thorny problem. It brings in a number of things that don't necessarily appear in a lot of the, the fairness and machine learning settings and dealing with classification and things. For one, we have multiple different sides of the problem. And Robin Burke laid this out in his paper last year on multi-sided fairness that we don't just have the, the subjects that we're deciding about. In Recommender, we have the people who are receiving the recommendations, the consumers. We have the people who are making items, the producers. We've got a few other uh, actors running around too, who are we being fair for? And then the, the, question, the kinds of questions that we deal with a lot about how are we measuring fairness? Are we talking about individual fairness, group fairness? Which of the 21 plus definitions are we talking about? In this particular paper, we're looking at consumer fairness and we're looking at a group fairness that looking at statistical parity of utility. where We have this measure of how effective the recommendation is. A little bit of vocabulary to help. As we go through this, recommender, we have items. Those are the things being recommended, the movies, the music, et cetera, uh, musical artists or musical songs. Those are going to be different settings, uh, et cetera. And then we have users who are receiving recommendations, and they're also providing the data that is being used to drive future recommendations in the form of ratings. And these ratings may be actual ratings, like you go in and say four stars. It may be thumbs up, thumbs down. It may be implicit feedback data, such as you played this song, you watched this movie. Um, we sometimes just call those ratings for terminological simplicity. Um, and then we have one of these things, how do we know how it works? There's three broad uh, categories of evaluation strategies. We have offline evaluation, which is, uh, a f uh, we take the machine learning, the information retrieval paradigm, we have a data set, we hide some data, we train the recommender model on the data we didn't hide, we ask it to generate recommendations. We look for the test data in the recommendations. And we say, the recommender is good if it recommends items that in our test data we know users liked. 
We have online evaluation, uh, often in the form of A-B testing, where we give two different recommenders to different subsets of our user group, and we see which one, how they respond to them. Do users watch more movies with our proposed recommendation enhancement? This is kind of the gold standard for a lot of industrial recommender evaluation. Does our recommender improve our key metrics with careful design, hopefully careful design and what those key metrics are? And then there's lab style user studies where we actually engage with users to see what they think about, um, or to, to see how they think about and how they process and, and respond to the recommendations. So with all of that, what we're doing in this paper is we're taking a paper I really liked from last year by Marotra et al on understanding demographic differences in search engines. And they did this in an online setting, mining uh, the logs from the Bing search engine to ask the question whether different demographic groups were obtaining similar benefit from, uh, from the Bing search engine. And in a traditional evaluation of one of these systems, we aggregate our effectiveness measures over all users. We have a measure of like, okay, query set, we have a measure of whether or not users are being satisfied with the results of their search. And we just aggregate that over that over all of our users and we say, okay, does this, this is a better search engine. And what they did was they broke that down by user demographics and looked at, is it effective for different, is it effective for men? Is it effective for women? Is it effective for different age groups? And found results such as older users were seeing higher success metrics than younger users. Um, what we do here is we translate this into an offline setting so that we can run it in an academic context with public data and see what's going on with our systems. And we translate this from uh, search into recommender systems and provide the code to do all of this if you want to. Um, the download link will be at the end of the slides. So with doing this kind of work, we have the problem of how do we get data? Where does it come from? And in recommender systems, we have some standard data sets. You may have heard of the Netflix prize. That data set is no longer public because of de-anonymization problems. There are several other data sets which are public. A service called MovieLens provides a movie data set. There's uh, data from Last.fm. There's data from Amazon review services. But one of the challenges, this is used commonly in recommender systems to evaluate, now are we doing good recommendation? One of the challenges for doing this kind of work is we don't just need, oh, this user watched these movies. We also want to know their demographic information. That information is much, much harder to come by um, if you want a much more comprehensive uh, survey of the challenges of dealing with data, these kinds of problems, I recommend the tutorial that Alexandra Oteanu and some of her colleagues have given at a number of conferences now on the limits of social data. Some approaches and then some ways they don't necessarily work. Um, some of the work I've seen in trying to do this space is doing various data enrichment techniques based on, say, computer vision techniques, and Joy showed us this morning why those things are kind of broken. We do, however, for recommender systems, have three public data sets that have self-reported user demographic information associated with them. So we used those. The MovieLens 1 million data set contains a million ratings from 6,000 users of movies. And then we have two data sets uh, from Last.fm, one of which has the top 50 artists along with play counts for uh, 360,000 users, and another much smaller data set of 1,000 users that has complete play histories. But each of these have uh, demographic data. They have a self-reported binary gender classification, and they have age. MovieLens has age brackets, and we just bracketed the last FM ages uh, to match the user, the MovieLens brackets for comparability. So we're going to take this data, and it looks about like this. So the, we see a significant gender imbalance. Uh, both data sets have substantially more male users than female users. We also see discrepancies in age with Last.fm having, uh, more, having the largest bulk of users in 18 to 24 and MovieLens being 25 to 34. I suspect that difference might be a lot of MovieLens users are probably graduate students who encountered it in a class. Um, so we have this and we're gonna use it to run an experiment. And the way we do this for an offline experiment is we take these consumption records, we split them into training and test data we run them through the recommender, we generate recommendations, and then we compare those with, uh, with the test data. We're using a measure called normalized discounted cumulative gain, which roughly measures the fraction of possible utility that the recommendations achieved. So if we had a perfect recommender that found all the items the user liked, that's a one. And so we compute a fraction of how, 
we, we compare our actual recommendations against that perfect recommender, and, and the result is a number in zero to one of how much of that utility we've achieved. There are some significant problems with this, but solving those are out of scope for this particular work. So this is a fairly standard methodology. We're moving forward with it to see what, uh, what kinds of problem or what we see with this kind of analysis. We ran several algorithms through it, some, some non-personalized algorithms, like just recommend the most popular stuff. That's a recommender, a list of most popular movies. And then some collaborative filters, all from the lens kit toolkit, so you can take this and rerun the code. The exact algorithms aren't super important. Uh, because we're more interested in the overall behavior of the concept. So when we do this, what do we find? We find that in both Last FM and Movie Lens, we see a gender discrepancy in the accuracy retrieved. Retrieve. So our y-axis here is our accuracy, our fraction of possible utility achieved. The numbers aren't super high. That's fairly common. Um, and the numbers, the, the ones with the, the purple squiggles, are statistically significant. Male users receive better recommendations in movie lens than female users. Interestingly, in Last FM, it goes the other way around. There's the, the, the underlying data distribution difference is the same, but in Last FM, we're getting better recommendations for female users than for male users. And then when we go and we look at age, we find a discrepancy. Different age groups are getting different recommendation qualities. Um, the youngest and oldest age brackets are seeing the best recommendations. Uh, we're not seeing any statistically significant differences in the movie lens data. So the initial first pass, yes, differences exist. We can see that different groups are getting different effectiveness from the recommender system. And if we're operating the system, we should ask ourselves, are we OK with our system providing a different level quality of service to some users than to other users? Um, I would argue that for many systems, we should not be OK with that. Uh, but it's not just the simple biggest group, most benefit story. So you kind of expect, oh, the, most group, the biggest group, we have the most information about them. We're able to learn their preferences the best. They can get the best recommendations. No. Smaller groups are seeing, uh, in the last FM, we're particularly we're seeing smaller groups get better recommendations. Um, what causes them? We. So we have these differences. We detect the existence of the differences. And then there's different things we can do to try to tease out why they're happening and see uh, what, if we control for various things, they still show up. And so we went and we controlled for a couple of things. One, the profile size, and two, the number of users in the group. When we control for profile size, um, we can see, OK, there's the light, um, that the male users or the, the last FM female users are still getting significantly better recommendation quality than male users, the green and the orange, vice versa for the movie, uh, movie lens data. And so we, we control for the profiles. We take out the effect of bigger pro, of whatever effect that how many you rated, movies they've rated in the past might have on their overall recommendation quality. And we say, oh, the difference persists after we control for that. We also re-balanced it. We resampled the data sets, to, uh, the movie lens data set, to produce one that had equal number of male and female users. The differences decrease some, but they and they're no longer statistically significant, but they don't completely disappear. So we have the same number of users of both genders now, or both genders that we have classification for in this data set. That's one of the limitations of this study. Um, but and we still see some difference, but it's smaller. We then went and uh, one of the problems with, um, with these evaluations is something called popularity bias, which means the, the evaluation protocol prefers recommenders that just recommend a lot of popular stuff. A way to cor we tried a way for correcting for that, and it just took that age discrepancy gap and just shifted it all over the place. It didn't change the other, the gender distributions, but it just completely changed the age distribution results. Differences were there, and they were completely different, which says when we correct for one problem, we change our picture for trying to identify another problem, and that is a problem. <laughs> Some limitations. Um, offline data provides a very limited picture. This is self-reported demographic data with a hard gender binary. This, we're not, we have not yet done an intersectional analysis. This is also fairly old data because we needed the data that we could get. And we have a few algorithms, but the code is there. So if you have a favorite algorithm, you want to try it, go download the code and see what it does. Um, not all users experience the system in the same way, and we need to measure this. But also, different protocols are going to produce different uh, 
can bring contradictory pictures. And there's this whole field of what does it mean for recommendation to be fair is just getting started. We've had a conversation, uh, we had a, a workshop on this, the Fat Rec workshop at Rexis last year. The next two papers you're going to see are extensions of work that appeared in that workshop. Um, we have a fairness and user modeling and adaptive personalization workshop coming up uh, this year. There's a lot of impact here and it's a lot of thorny and interesting problems to try to solve and I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, hi, thank you. Fascinating work uh, and raises a lot of interesting questions when you start talking about recommendations for categories that might be covered by the law, like, uh, hey, you might wanna look at this job or you might wanna look at, uh, look at this house. I, I just a uh, quick question, I might have missed this, but can you just say a little bit more about how you made the decision for whether a recommendation was a good recommendation or, or not, whether it was a successful recommendation? Thanks. So what we do is we take, uh, we take the movies that the user has rated and we hold out, say, five of them and we say those are our test movies. So we hide those from the data sets, we pretend that the uh, recommender has, does not know the user has, has seen those movies. We then uh, train the recommender and we then see if it recommended those five movies. And if it did, um, well, anytime one of those five movies shows up in the recommendation list, we say, hey, that was a good recommendation. We know that's a movie the user liked. Um, there are some problems with this, particularly around uh, what happens with user movies the user would like but didn't know about, the exact ones that we would like the recommender to help them find. Um, that is a big problem, the extent of which one of my graduate students is currently working on trying to measure. Hi, thank you for the great talk and great work. Uh, so my question was basically uh, that uh, the way you define fairness is that the accuracy of your recommendation should be, let's say, equally accurate for the two demographic groups, if there are two. So, uh, so right now, like, there could be intrinsic differences in, like, let's say, variants of uh, the things they like. Like, what I like today, I might not like tomorrow, and this could be different for the two groups. And should we be respecting that? Like, think of uh, items on on Amazon. Like I make, like there are people in certain groups that might like the first thing they see and other groups spend a lot of time before choosing one and there are systematic differences there. So that's a really good question, thank you. Um, the, the Marotra paper did a lot of work with causal inference to try to, to control for many of those kinds of, of differences and we have not gone that deep uh, in this particular work but I think what we need to do there is go do the work with, with, particularly with causal inference, to try to understand what those causes are, and then we have to make a value judgment about whether this cause or that cause is something we should try to correct for. Um, one thing we have not yet controlled for that we're planning to do in future work is to go look at, say, the variance. If a u some users may have a more consistent set of things they like and others a more varied set, that's gonna impact the ease of recommending for them. If we control for that, do we still see those differences? I, I haven't gone and checked the data yet to confirm this, but I suspect that is probably what's going on with women receiving, with the, the anti-correlation in the last FM data set is if our minority groups there are, they look more consistent in their preferences in the underlying data, then that could produce the, the higher accuracies we're seeing for them. But I think the, the core thing is, understand the causes, and then make the value judgment on a cause-by-cause -cause basis. Uh, there's obviously two more recommendation systems papers in this session. Could you sort of call out anything that the audience should be looking out for to, to see the application of your work to, that, to those papers? Um, so the, the first piece of that is just uh, looking at this slide I had at the beginning, or early on, where we're positioned in this space. Um, in this work, we're looking mostly at consumer fairness. Uh, the other work is looking mostly at provider fairness, for one thing. Um, we're looking at different pieces of the space, and that makes very different problems, very different findings, very different, uh, or very different implications as well. That, I think, is the big difference, is looking at where we are uh, in the space of different recommendation fairness problems. 